Hello and welcome to Marxism Today. Uh, I'm your host, Red Wagner, joined by... Tony Schmidt. And today we have a special guest, a guest we've never had on and we're very happy to have. Tom, would you care Tom. to introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Tom O'Brien, uh, and I'm the host of the From Alpha to Omega podcast. Which is an awesome podcast, by the way, <laughs> uh, for the listeners. If you have not checked out Alpha to Omega, please do. It's... If you like what we do, it's it's sort of the denser, crunchier, more academic version. You have Tom and his experts, and yeah, so. Tom has lots of academic, like real experts, on his show. Well, so you well, don't just get us <laughs> reacting it. Yeah, no, I, I ask some questions and they they talk for ten minutes. That's essentially how. <laughs> and I just have to have sufficient knowledge to be able to come up with a semi-coherent question. That's my that's my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so t today. Tom is going to talk to us about one of the more advanced parts, I would call it more advanced parts, of Marxist theory, the falling rate of profit. And we've, we've only mentioned it briefly on the show before. Yeah, I listened to one of your re more recent uh, episodes where you talked, where I, I'm not sure which, which one was it, which one of you guys was saying that you didn't really get why it was such a bone of contention between all these bearded Marxist types. Uh, it was probably so, me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was like kind of going, oh, that's interesting because, uh, well, I find it a very interesting topic and I too find it interesting that it's such a bone of contention. Uh, yeah. Um, Let's start with maybe okay. the basics of uh, of value theory. So the yeah, very simple there. insight that Marx gives is that uh, it's only human labor that can create value. So machines can create value. It's purely human labor. And how a capitalist makes a profit is by not paying the laborer the full value of the product that they create. They only pay them how they pay them a wage, and that wage is. It's what Marx would call their kind of like their labor power, their ability to get a wage from a capitalist. So mm -hmm. the whole thing about capitalism is getting a surplus. So you pay the worker, maybe if they work eight hours, you pay them the equivalent of the first three hours and the produce of the second five hours, that goes to the capitalist. That's the kind of nuts and bolts of it. The weird thing that happens, Marx noticed, is that if labor is the only thing that creates value, the problem comes is when the, all different capitalists are trying to compete against each other and sell their products for cheaper. They're always looking to skimp on paying workers money. So what they tend to do is to get time-saving equipment that will help the individual worker be more efficient. But what this ends up doing is if a capitalist has to spend, say, well, like the one I like to think about is, say, a doctor. Say you were 100 years ago and you ring up, your child is sick, and you say, oh, I'll ring the doctor, and the doctor comes on his horse, and mm -hmm. he has a bag, and it might have a stethoscope in it, right? But, like, if your child is very sick nowadays, what might happen is maybe an ambulance comes, and the amount of equipment that they have with them to see if your child is sick is an awful lot bigger. So the amount of capital that it takes to, say, be a doctor who's going to do a house call now You've got to have way more machinery than you used to have. And because the ratio of machinery is bigger to, say, the amount of money you have to pay in wages, there's less room for profit. So it's this kind of general tendency in capitalism, because they're always trying to be competitive with each other, is that more machinery is used per head of labor. But paradoxically, this means then that the rate of profit will be lower. I don't know if that... I, how does, does... Does that kind of get to the nuts and bolts of it. I, I think we should talk a little bit, because that, this, I think, really draws the difference between two things. There is, on the one hand, the amount of labor that goes into a commodity, and then there's also the amount of investment that the capitalist must do, which is the labor plus the capital investment. And 
that there's a distinction between those because as you're saying the the capitalist tends over time because of technological innovation to invest more and more in the fixed capital rather than in the human labor yeah so th there's this kind of it is always expanding amount of machinery per worker this is the general tendency and this general tendency is driven by the if we have two firms competing one firm introduces a new piece of machinery which means he's able to pay the workers less and produce this thing cheaper but then the other guy will cop on and then the next thing they're both using those lumps of machinery and now if they want to get more profitable again or if they want to compete better with the other guy they have to invest more and more so they end up investing more and more money in machines but the machines can never create the value it's only the human now i think one of the most challenging things about the theory is the apparent counterintuitiveness that that may come up when you are first introduced to it and that being and maybe we want to draw a distinction here between the long run and the short run which i think is what you were getting into just a moment ago why would an individual capitalist choose to invest more in capital if it will lower his rate of profit yeah it's a very counterintuitive concept you know, it's one of these uh, things whereby what is uh, good for the individual is is poor for the system. Mm -hmm. But the individual is always drawn to try <laughs> and do it. You know, capitalists, you know, you just need to look at, say, the world in general. They don't care about the system. They really just care about their own individual profit rate. So each individual capitalist is competing against the other capitalists. But even though if they compete, they know that they're probably going to systemically create a crisis, they, they just can't help themselves. Yeah. You know, it's just this counterintuitive thing that what actually makes capitalism, it, it, it's weird as well, because this is actually what makes capitalism so good. This is what made Marx such a fan of capitalism. The competitive drive, always seeking to undercut labor, is what makes it so productive and it makes it so successful, is also the same thing that causes it to kind of hit crisis, is that the, by being more productive, you're being less profitable. And it's this real tension, this kind of contradiction right at the heart of capitalism, like super, that's always this tension that's right there and then. And it seems to me to make a lot of sense. We look at, if we look to, say, the U.S. deindustrialized in the 1970s, why was it deindustrialized? Because labor was cheaper somewhere else, and the, the profit rate wasn't good in America. So you can understand an awful lot, I think, by this dynamic of the tension at the heart of capitalism. Yeah, the, it, I think it's interesting that the capitalists seek, or the drive to seek the lowest, I guess, wages for workers around the world. I, uh, for a job I have now, I uh, call a lot of businesses to do surveys for market research. And I recently talked to a manufacturer of uh, boat engines, and they said that they, like any good business person, bid local contractors uh, for parts against Chinese competitors to drive all the prices down to the lowest. And, you know, it's, just, it's that sort of weird mentality that even, I think they might even be like proudly made in America people too. I, mean, I just don't understand how they can't see that they crush the wages and really destroy the system in their, I guess, I don't know, zeal to make their profit off of it. It's the coercive laws of competition, like like Tom was mentioning, that each each capitalist must do what's in his interest to in order to survive as a capitalist. However, their collective efforts undermine the system as a whole. Yeah, even if you're a nice guy, if you're a capitalist and you're a nice guy, you can't but do this kind of harsh business lines because if you do you'll, you'll surely be out of business pretty quickly you know if that boat manufacturer is using parts from america and they cost 10 percent more and that has to either either make his boats more expensive or cut into his bottom line more than likely he's going to lose market share or lose profit which is probably close enough to the same thing you know so there's there's no way out of that that thing yeah there's, it's just purely fundamental Another thing that I think can make the theory difficult is the another contradiction, which is the difference between what profit actually is and actual output. 
because it can be counterintuitive to say, well, we have technological innovation, and with that innovation, we can produce more output. We can make more commodities with faster, with less human labor. How could that lead to smaller profits? Again, going to where I've been doing like uh, research on all these companies, you look at a company like that one, I think the boat one, I think they made uh, $345 million a year in, pro- or in sales, but their profit, I think, was closer to 10 or $20 million. So wow. it, I, I found that very startling when looking at all these things, because all of the, you know, looking even at just for fun at some large companies, the amount of profit they make compared to the amount of sales is very different. And I notice in a lot of business, like news and reporting, they always report the sales. You don't see them mentioning a ton about profit. It's it's mostly sales that are reported. Yeah, no, that's a, that's an amazing statistic that is really quite low like 10 if it's 10 million on 380 million it's probably three percent profit yeah and i don't know if that's right that's trying to remember yeah even if it's even if it's even if it's say 20 million say even if it's 30 million it's less than 10 percent profit yeah and Mm -hmm. you know it doesn't take much in a recession to knock your you know your sales down by a lot especially in a luxury item like a boat you could imagine you go from 10% profit and you get a really bad year you could make 20 30% loss you know which kind of can lead you to think about how brittle a comp the chances of a company surviving are when the profit rate is low if a profit rate if they were making 100 million dollars on 300 million dollars you know they can they could hit of you know 100 million on their profit but you know th- this 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 thing of the of the profit rate being driven down leads to like a real kind of fragility within the system that all of these different businesses instead of having a big buffer where they can withstand shocks economically now they're you know now they're kind of going my god i hope our sales don't drop 10% next year or we could be bust tom do you think that that is an important reason that that connects into an important reason why so many Marxists reject the theory. In other words, are Marxists rejecting it because they don't want people to feel sympathy for capitalists who have hard decisions to make, who who cannot stay in business or or have low profits? Well, I think the reason why Marxists, a lot of Marxists reject this, is is a very complex one, and I think it. I don't know if it if that's the reason. I think it's more to do with a kind of Cold War politics, to be honest. You can imagine when Marx came along and came out with his theories for Das Kapital and all of that, political economy at the time, which is based on Adam Smith and David Ricardo and these guys, he totally revolutionized it, you know? Mm-hmm. And he solved a whole load of different problems that were there at the time that were inconsistencies of Ricardo and inconsistencies in, in, in Adam Smith. And also he explained what, at the time, this falling rate of profit was accepted by every school in economic thought. It was a statistical fact. They all saw it. They all knew it was true, but they didn't have explanations for it. There was some, but they didn't really work. But Marx came along with this explanation and it was kind of a, a groundbreaking one. But as soon as Marx came up with this theory what we saw was that all of the major economists at the time were all value theory economists like Marx's. He's got a labor theory of value. Now, he augment, he his was slightly different and it solved some problems and other guys had. But the kind of political implications of what Marx was saying was like, hey, everybody's exploiting us. You know, mm-hmm. instead of, you know, being a pro-business or an invisible hand or of, of, of Adam Smith, you know, or whatever, that... Not that Adam Smith was totally pro-business, but you know, these were business-friendly, classical, liber- liberal kind of ideas. The solutions were so bad <laughs> for capitalism and the power structures that be that this labor theory, every all the economics ditched it for marginalism, which is something technical. I don't know if we want to get into that, but they kind of they got rid of all this idea of labor theory of value kind of within about 20, 20 years. Very few people were really, well, not very few, but economists, bourgeois economists had to kind of change all their economic theory because of the political implications of what Marx is doing. And because of this, ever since, there's been a very determined project, I think, for people to attack Marx and to try and find logical problems with it. And there was one big 
technical problem that was called the transformation problem. And that, I think, is why that problem that was discovered, I think, is has since been shown not to be a problem, has caused a lot of Marxists to lose faith in Marxist theory. And, I, and subsequently, they kind of reject some parts of Marxism, uh, Marxist economic work. And, I, and this is a part that is one of the big, I think, victims of this uh, rejection of some of Marxist theory, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You were were talking earlier that we we were talking about watching the David Harvey uh, Marx video, the Capital videos. Like to, I've done that for the first two volumes of Marx. This is Capital. When I was reading them, I was watching these David Harvey videos on YouTube and listening to his lectures on it as we're going along. But like, say somebody like David Harvey is probably one of, or if not the most famous famous Marxist economists, well, Marxist economists alive. He's also, mm -hmm. he's really a geographer. But he would actually say that he doesn't think Marx's value theory works. So, like, you have mm -hmm. the most famous Marxist, one of them in the world, and he would actually say that he doesn't think it works. Which is kind of crazy to me because I, I don't know what's left. If you, if you don't think value theory has got validity, to me that if everything you read capital volume one and two and if value theory doesn't make sense well then the rest of it to me is just like you might as well just flush it down the toilet <laughs> yeah. because because the argument from the falling rate of profit theory is if value is produced by human labor then logically the falling rate of profit theory must follow so if you reject the conclusion you must reject the premise of the labor theory of value. And if you reject the labor theory of value... You have then, to reject the falling rate of profit. Yeah. And, and yeah. I mean, to me, what... And maybe this, maybe this is a difference, I don't know. To me, what sits at the heart of Marxist criticism is the theory of surplus value and exploitation. However, yeah. that is also built upon the theory of the labor theory of value uh, to a certain extent. Absolutely, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's like yin and yang. You can't get those two apart. I, I, so to me, it's like if value theory is correct, and I think it really is, then there's just no problem. There's, there's no problem with the fallen rate of profit. And I think if, if we just look at our lives, you know, if we look at the type of jobs that people have in an industrialized world, we use way more machinery. Than we than we used to use per head, or even if I think of say my my parents' house, if I, if I just think about the amount of electronics that are in my folks' house now, they're not capitalists; they're not using it to create profit, but just as a kind of a way to think about the amount of machinery that each person uses. You know, my my parents they have a DVD player in that, they have a video player. They don't use either; they actually don't know how to work them. You know, <laughs> they have you know they have a microwave where they used to only have a cooker. This general tendency of extra mechanical devices that we use yeah. both in consumption but the real thing that matters is production but consumption is a mirror of of production mm -hmm. yeah as i'm looking around at all the uh, electronics you know in order to record this we have two laptops and a soundboard and mics and <laughs> you know that's it's quite a bit of capital well okay it's quite a bit of Things that it could used be used to be. for capital. Yeah, yeah it's, it's yeah, not it's, being used for capital. Unfortunately, <laughs> we make no surplus value off <laughs> off of this. Not venture. yet. Not yet. <laughs> no, you could argue we make a loss. In fact, because we don't make anything. Yeah, I would well, say yeah, I, think, I think my theory is if you don't keep track, it doesn't actually count as a loss. Okay, I'll buy that. <laughs> <laughs> Who's counting? Yes. So but the other thing that's kind of confusing about it, I think, is that. There, Marx goes on about all these counter tendencies, right? Mm. So he talks about there are how other things can cause the rate of profit to go back up, right? So yeah. if, say, I'm working and I'm getting maybe, if I work eight hours a day, I'm earning, maybe I'm paid four hours worth of, say, wages and the four hours goes to the capitalist. Mm -hmm. And say now the capitalist says, oh, my profit rate is, is, is going down. So he goes, screw you, worker. I'm giving you three hours instead of four hours, and I'm taking five, right? Mm -hmm. And if he does that, the capitalist will actually increase his profit. So there are many different ways to go around actually increasing this 
rate of profit again. But the thing is that you can't drive the system down to where workers are getting zero because they have to live and they have to eat, Mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so, you know, there's only so much exploitation and increasing exploitation you can do to increase the profit rate. So it's not like it's a it's a solution systemically. It just means maybe you can put off a crisis further. And then there are other things that can cause this falling rate of profit to improve. One of them would be, say, like what happened in the Great Depression in America, when all these businesses went bust, loads of businesses went bust. And then let's say I'm a capitalist and I've got some, I happen to just have not gone bust. And I can see, Jesus, that factory that's over there that was going to cost me 10 million quid to buy now because nobody wants to buy it. I can buy it for half a million bucks and I can then open up that factory. And because I, I paid so little for my uh, capital stock, I can make a huge profit instead of having maybe a factory where it costs $10 million and I have to pay a, a million dollars in wages and maybe I make 5% or something on it. Now I've got a 5 million or a half a million pound uh, of a ca- I paid out for the capital and a million pound a worker. And the next thing you know, Jesus, I could be making 40% profits. So there's a, there's a couple of ways that it can, it can go, it can be brought back. Yeah. And I think people get confused by this because they think, well, Jesus, is this, it can go up and it can go down. Sure. What does that mean? But the general tendency is down much like I think a good way I've heard somebody describing it as like gravity, you know, things tend to fall downwards towards the, Towards that, I'm sure that's not a technical way of putting it. <laughs> Things tend to, you know, to to be attracted to a large, larger gravitational so body. So the Earth is a big, big ass body, and say you got a leaf, the leaf is going to be attracted to the big body. But that doesn't mean that the leaf has to go down. You know, it can get caught in eddies of drafts of currents that bring it back up, and maybe it can go down generally over time. But you know, the, the general tendency is for that leaf to hit the ground, even though it doesn't always have to do it building on you know just another way that capitalism gets by is war it's the the destruction of capital not just the devaluation which yeah. you know the capital i mean look at the united states we've been at war since i don't know what world war Two essentially like we've never not been at war and a lot of these com- countries that we go in to destroy it's to precisely take over capital it's not too hard to see that with iraq oh look halliburton stepped in to take over all the oil fields Absolutely, you know they can get their hands on some new ca- new capital. One of the directions I'd also like to go is to talk about the implications of what understanding the theory means for activism or or agitation or or any revolutionary change. So, if, for example, you mentioned earlier one of the one of the counter tendencies is capitalists to try to lower workers wages and and if we understand the falling rate of profit theory we realize that that is an attempt to save capitalism in a way that in in order to save capitalism what may be necessary is greater amounts of exploitation yeah it's very interesting you have this very strange dynamic that after say the great depression when everything went so badly wrong capitalism say people say things like roosevelt saved capitalism in America, the people were so radicalized by having 25, 30% unemployment rates. They said, God, this capitalism sucks. <laughs> that, you know, the ruling class said, Christ, you know, we better never let this happen again. And then in 2008, 2009, we had the first big mega crisis in America and say Western Europe since, since then. And this time they didn't allow, except in Greece, say, and, and Spain, they didn't in Ireland, but they didn't allow, say, the American economy to go to the real depths that happened in the Great Depression. But the problem with this is, is that the Great Depression is what led to the boom, a Marxist would say. The Great Depression was what led actually to the revitalization of capitalism in the 40s and the 50s, and the 60s, is that so much capital was destroyed both in war and as, a, as, a, as, as from the crash of the economy that people were able to buy the capital stock so cheap now they make mega profits and so we had this you know the golden period of u.s capitalism but now they're so afraid to allow the system to kind of cleanse itself like it did in the great depression 
you know, they're so afraid that people will get radicalized and, and throw them out of power. And maybe there'll be revolution after 10, 15 years of it, is that they decided to try and paper over the cracks. But still, you see, the problem is, is that the profit rate now is still really low. So the next time there's, the system is sick, you know, essentially, they didn't allow the system to like, I don't know, purge itself. They kept it, they kept decided it's better off being kind of having a cold <laughs> than, you know, than ending up with pneumonia and then getting better or something. So that this kind of dynamic is that the system is, is still quite sick. But who knows, what does this mean for politics? In Like in the Great Depression, it meant, you know, the rise of radical left politics in, you know, in America. And, you know, just look at what happened in Europe. But who knows, are we going to be radicalized anyway by just things being so crap for so long? You know, does stagnation lead to the same thing? I, I don't know. It's It's very interesting. Yeah, well, what I'd be worried about with, as far as politics go, is sort of an inversion of where we had fascism before to being where there's more socialists and more socialist type thing where there's fascists. Like France, you know, always very left. I think, oh, what's her name? Uh, Marie Le Pen. Yeah, Le Pen. She, like, they, I just saw a poll that after this uh, attack on the newspaper, they were polling at a third of the population mm. if the election was tomorrow she would win and that is beyond terrifying especially in a country like france that's always been well normally always had a pretty strong you know left revolutionary bent yeah very much so in greece i mean i'm very happy to see Syriza or however that's pronounced um take the victory uh because i mean the golden dawn has been edging up and that's also just Super, super terrifying. And in the United States here, I think a lot of these uh, extreme right-wing people who, I don't know how much of the ridiculous politics of the U.S. makes it uh, over there to you. Too much. Yeah. But like our governor, Scott Walker, here in Wisconsin is just, oh man, this guy's a monster. And not just as a capitalist, but I think, you know, there's a very proto-fascist thing to what they do. And it's very anti-intellectual. Like, uh, this last week, the governor's decided he's going to cut $300 million out of uh, the public university system and spend 260 of that uh, public money on a new uh, stadium for uh, the professional basketball team that nobody pays attention to. Which is a lot of money here in Wisconsin because we are not a big state. Yeah. The university yeah, I, I go to, I uh, got an email from, or, you know, the chancellor put out something. We're going to lose between seven and eight and a half million dollars at just the one I go to over the next two years, and they can't raise tuition either, so. That's kind of, yeah, it's pretty shocking, isn't it? Yeah. Tom, I think you were kind of referring to the idea of there's, kind of two strategies that we see when when we have a crisis come up where we can let things become horrible and let capitalism do its kind of purging that it does so that it can uh, recover its profitability. Or we can somehow try to manage that crisis, which seems to be more the tactic today, where profitability doesn't really recover in the way that it could, but also the the human suffering doesn't reach the levels that it could. Is that a correct summary of kind of what you were saying? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I think that's an interesting question for us as Marxists politically, because maybe in some areas, like, uh, for example, we mentioned Greece, it seems like that has actually been good for the left in Greece. Um, however, I think for a lot of places in the United States, maybe I'm just being too pessimistic, but I think for the majority of the United States, people become more reactionary when their living standards go down. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think yeah. that's one of the sort of the conundrums is that, you know, when things crash, I, I think it's the Trotskyist thought that, you know, when things get bad enough, people eventually revolt, which I think is true. But I also think, yeah, people have a very big uh, reactionary bent. It stops becoming oh, man, we all better work together to, well, where am I going to get, you know, my next meal from? I don't care about any of the rest of you. It's true, but then you also had Occupy in America, you know, and that was probably a lot bigger than the Tea Party was, you know, as in for numbers-wise, people that were inspired by it, do you think? It's hard to say. It's hard to say because Occupy is sort of, Occupy was a really weird movement because I think their horizontalism was too extreme, and it it basically... 
It was a lot of people basically saying they were unhappy with the system, and that's about all I think they really said, is that they were just unhappy. I mean, it's inspired a lot of different things here and there, like, uh, again, in Madison, there's the result of the Occupy group in Madison here, is they've started building tiny homes for homeless people, so they're trying to, you know, actually house them. So I think there's a lot of little things that spun off like that, but I think the Tea Party is just so much more visible, especially in politics and electoral politics. It's sort of hard to get a handle as to who who has more numbers and who really has more influence in that way. My stance yeah. on, on the two is that what Occupy Wall Street really did was their their biggest accomplishment overall was to change the debate because now every if if you come out with wealth or income statistics almost everyone includes the 1% and sometimes they even include the statistic for what the other 99% is which i think is great because if you look at income and wealth statistics before that everything was by quintiles so when when you look at the top level as the top 20% there's a wide range of people in there that you're not making a distinction between the educated upper levels of the working class or middle class, whatever you want to call them, and the capitalist class. You're lumping them all together with, with probably way too many working class people to water down the capitalist class. When you get 1%, and actually it'd probably be even better if it were the 0.01%, but we'll we'll settle for the 1% now. I think that was their biggest accomplishment, which is a big deal. When it it is, to- and but it, also they, they didn't have access to media in any kind of a positive way either, you know? No, not at all. And, and I think that's the other thing is the Tea Party, I don't know if it was smaller or bigger, but it had a lot more structural power. You know, in the United States, we have lots of elected politicians who identify as Tea Party politicians. And maybe there's an Occupy Wall Street politician somewhere, but I don't know of one who has like identified as that or campaigned on that, where that is true for the Tea Party. Partially because they were very successfully brought into the Republican Party to a certain degree. They were essentially brought in as the right wing or a, a particular type of the right wing. There's lots of right wings to the Republican Party. We can get into that later. Yeah. But A lot of wrong wings as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but their level of institutional power is just impressive compared to Occupy Wall Street, sadly. It seems kind of astroturf kind of uh, yeah. organization. You know, money from powerful, you know, the Koch brothers, I think, and these guys, you know, so... You'd wonder if they, if if Occupy had their millions, what impact it would have had, you yeah, know, or, or support from the capitalist class. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but would they have accepted that support? Is the, that, I mean, that's the other problem. Is if you can get support from, you know, that kind of money and support, is that something you really want? Is there is there not one decent revolutionary billionaire in the world? That's what I always wonder. <laughs> Just well, one. As many as it there seems one. to be. You know. <laughs> All you need is one billionaire. <laughs> revolutionary. They could do a lot of good. Instead, we get the cockwoodders. No, yeah. Yeah. but I think I think the lo- the falling rate of profit. I think is got, I think it's a very interesting political thing because also it speaks towards the kind of internal sickness of the system. It it kind of points to the system being kind of the system itself is going to eat itself out. You know, some kind of. I don't know. It's like a cancer. The system generates its own cancer. I think this is why a lot of people who are Marxists nowadays don't agree with it. I, I think normal Marxists, people who just read capital like me or you or, or whoever think, yeah, this stuff makes an awful lot of sense. And even the empirical data backs it up. But I think if you're in the academy, if you, if you want to get a job, you can't be a, an actual revolutionary Marxist professor. I think you kind of kind of play the politics and get in the door and try and say the right thing. Mm-hmm. You know, that if you were to actually say that they were falling rate of profit, that's correct. It kind of means that capitalism is kind of fucked. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. It, it means that like, there's no way out for capitalism unless there's a terrible, terrible crisis. And then the profit rate mightn't even recover to what it was, say, in the 1940s. Maybe because we've got so much more machinery nowadays that it'll only recover to maybe what it was in the 1960s. And then in to 20, in 2080 or something, we're going to have the mother load of all crises or something, you know? Yeah. 
I think for the politics of it, for a lot of people, it's why it's it's kind of not people don't want to go into it. There's a lot of people I think who are kind of left wing but kind of liberal, and they just don't want to deal with this part of Marx. Yeah, I think in general people have a tendency, and maybe that's what happens with the Marxists is people just don't want to worry about it. People don't want to think about the future, and I guess I you know it's capitalism itself. Maybe that's a product of capitalism is that people don't want to think long term and they don't want to think systemic. I butt heads a lot with people who you know they just don't care. Like it's really hard to make people care, like even about something that's you know perhaps less controversial. Although I guess not here necessarily in the United States, is like climate change. Like it's. You know, every everything is obvious that this is a huge problem, and we need to deal with it today, not tomorrow. But you, I mean, you just can't get anybody to care very much, or at least not on a big enough level to actually make a change. So I, maybe that's the tendency in Marxism is that people get comfortable sort of just critiquing the system and don't actually really want to. Not that they don't want to change it, but, you know, it's it's not easy. It's a daunting task. You're talking about worldwide entrenched power in every facet of everything. I mean, I, I have no idea how you go about taking that out, but it doesn't mean I don't want to try. I think one of the difficult parts is that we as Marxists support working people. And so even if an argument comes up within the context of a capitalist system, you know, if if I have a chance to vote for a politician who says he's going to do something to to raise wages for workers, I'm going to vote for that guy. That might not be good for capitalism. Maybe that's the point we need to make, is this, this will just increase crises because it will further disrupt the rate of profit. I don't know, but I think the attractive thing to rejecting the theory is you can say, oh, it's it's good for capitalism and it's what I believe. You know, people, yeah, it's it's the idea that we want to support workers, but we know that we probably can't get a revolution in the next year or something like what I can do is is vote for this guy or what I can do is have a protest for a 15 hour or $15 an hour minimum wage. Yeah, no, totally. Well, I think also it's kind of maybe to do with maybe the balance of the forces as well. If you look at, say, America and you think, you know, oh, how far are they away from a communist utopia? <laughs> you know, you probably have to say quite a distance. So what are you going to do in the meantime? But it's that tension between do we want to Im- improve our lot now or, you know, what Chomsky would say, if you had a some kind of feudal lord and he was going to kill your brother, would you petition the lord to not kill your brother? And you'd say, yeah, you would, but that doesn't mean that you support feudalism. But then the other thing is that, you know, maybe if my brother got killed, everybody in our village would go crazy and then we'd kill the feudal lord. And so it's like, <laughs> no, you know, this dynamic, it's, uh, I suppose that's, that's the political judgment, I think. But uh, it's a very difficult one and I don't think there's any easy answer or answer that's universally correct, if you know what I mean. Yeah. If you look at, say, the, the rise of radical left parties, nearly all, I don't know, I'm not a historian, so that sounds, so I'm probably totally wrong, but it seems to me like nearly always <laughs> it's either to do with huge economic crisis and things go to shit or world or some type of war where things go to shit and people tend to get radicalized when things get bad. So it, you look at Syriza now, there's no way... Let's see how radical they are. Who knows? I read their manifesto, their 40-point manifesto. Some of it was pretty radical in that now, it must be said. Or you look at, say, the Labour Party in England when they got into power after World War Two. You know, they nationalised nearly everything. You know, <laughs> they literally went and did nationalised everything they could get their hands on. You know, so some of these, but I don't think that's the answer to just to nationalise. And But there, there were radical parties that came out of these wars. What's going to come out of long-term stagnation? I don't know. Japan has been in stagnation for 20 years, 20, probably 25 years now, maybe 28 years. Japan has been in long-term stagnation, and they haven't been radicalized. So maybe the capitalists are right. Maybe we'll just keep them, you know, slowly squash their testicles instead of <laughs> punch, punching them. <laughs> it, until the point where they, they can't make profits, and we say, well, what's the use of this system we gotta, <laughs> if they're not going to hire anyone we're at a standoff they're not going to hire anyone we're not going to work and they, for nothing and then you're like god damn it I'm sterile <laughs> <laughs> 
wonder about capitalism, if that'll go out in a whimper or a bang. Maybe that's the problem, is that we all think of it as a big revolution, and it's just going to be like one day people are like, meh, yeah, let's do something else. <laughs> <laughs> wishful thinking. So, yeah. I think that's wishful thinking. <laughs> <laughs> be easy. <laughs> Tom, one thing I wanted to also ask about is how the falling rate of profit relates to theories of underconsumption. Because these are, I, in, in my experience, they're usually posed as opposites. As you, you're either the, on the underconsumption side or you're on the falling rate of profit side. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, and this again plays into the politics of whether the system is possible. You know, it's kind of a, kind of these two clashes in within Marxism. I think one of them is kind of close to, some Marxists are really kind of comes down to it when they talk about underconsumption. They're really close to Keynesians, which means that, you know, we can really manage the capitalist system. We just got to get the balance right between what we do with the consumption side, so how much we pay workers. And if we pay workers enough, there's a sweet spot whereby everything will be grand and we'll all have a stable economic system. But I think that when you look at the evidence, when it comes down to it, consumption, like I just did a show actually with a, with a guy who's in a professor in um, Jose Tapia in, in Philadelphia. And he was like looking at the, the evidence, you know, the, the actual evidence for, for these theories. And what you see is that when you hit a crisis period, like say 2008, say the people who already have a job, most of the time they've got a contract in their job or a contract for their job in a Say you're going to get paid forty thousand dollars per year with inflation index rises, right? And the crisis hits, but their wages tend to stay reasonably stable when this crisis hits. So most of the time, it's not like there's a sudden fall off in consumption that causes this crisis. That it's literally consumption is really quite stable when you look at it. And the thing that falls off is when profits start. Going kind of going down a bit and business kind of pull up and they say, God, I'm not investing any more money. So, so I just got to get a little bit technical there. But so what we look at is we've got two basic theories under consumption where the workers aren't getting kind of paid enough to buy the products. And then you got fallen rate of profit. When you look at the evidence again, the evidence doesn't work for under consumption. So it's kind of like a, I find myself using the word bourgeois more and more as I read Marx, <laughs> but it's kind of like a, a bourgeois idea that somebody who likes Marxism but they also don't want to kind of commit <laughs> that's the way I feel about it they just don't want to commit to the logic the hard logic of it is that like you know that the system is inherently fundamentally unstable and it's driven by the, the competitive profit seeking motives of the capitalists which leads to the fallen rate of profit which is going to lead to crises and you can manage the, the level of consumption perfectly but it won't get away from that underlying crisis. Now, couldn't you unify the two, though, and say that, well, the falling rate of profit causes a depression in the workers' wages, which also causes underconsumption? I mean, wouldn't that make sense? Well, the underconsumption is this kind of idea that, that everything is, like, that. say, the ratio between what the capitalist is taking and what the wages are given to the labor is inconsistent to buy the produce and to keep the system functioning right. to keep consumption up enough. But like in, in volume two of capitalism, Marx comes up with these kind of simplistic models for, for a capitalist system. And he shows that for any given level of say exploitation, that the system can function at that level of exploitation. So without, he, he does this model of ignoring any changes in, uh, in, in technology. So the falling rate of profit doesn't come into it. So he shows that there is no difference between if the worker gets one out of his eight hours in pay or seven out of his eight hours in pay. Either of them can work stably. So I don't think that it's even really a problem. I think the underconsumptionism thing is really a kind of a, I think it's a political project, you know. When you look at the statistics for how consumption, say, behaved in America up to 2009, say, it just kind of, it's very, very, very stable. It's no change. And then all of a sudden there's a crisis and it drops a bit after the crisis. So it's really, really hard to see how you can support it with the data. But politically, I think it makes a lot of sense. If you're a union and you've got some workers and you don't want to talk to them about revolution, 
Yeah. You don't say, screw, uh, the system is inherently contradictory. Marx is right. Let the negation be negated <laughs> or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. They're not going to say that. They're kind of going to go to say to them, oh, they're not paying us enough to keep the system working. Let's get $15 an hour. This will solve our problems. But it won't solve the problem. But it's a political decision. I think a lot of the guys who are the economists that come up with these underconsumption things, frequently the Marxist economists, they work for labor unions, you know? I mm -hmm. don't think it's a coincidence. You don't hear too many labor unions go, oh, the falling rate of profit means we're all doomed. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe the international workers of the world, maybe they say it, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but there's not too many, I don't think. Yeah, there are not a lot of wobblies these days, unfortunately. No. They sound cool, though, from what little I know of them. Yeah, there's a a really good uh, graphic biography of them by uh, actually a local guy here named Paul Buell. He edits, I think it's just called Wobblies. It's, uh, it's very cool if you ever get a chance to check it out. It goes through, I think, their entire history. Like a graphic novel, is it? Yeah, a graphic novel history. He does a lot of them for uh, left-wing things. Like, um, I remember he's got like a Che and a Emma Goldman and... I can't remember the other ones I've looked at, but he's got a lot. They're good. You know, I must uh, check him out. I, I had a guy on the show recently that's a comic writer. He did one for the guy who, uh, uh, Michael Albert, who does uh, Zenet and, and who was involved in the SDS in the, in the 70s or the student, uh, radical student organizations. So it's pretty, pretty good, yeah. It's a good way to, to get it to people in an e easy readable format. The... I remember hearing not long ago that there was, what was it, a manga of Capital came out somewhere? Yeah, I read that. Oh, did yeah. you? No, I read, I heard about it in Japan, was it? Did I, I think it came out in Japan and it became a bestseller. <laughs> yeah, well, they have an English version of it. It's, it was not what I was expecting, because I was expecting to sort of go through, I guess, sort of the layout of Capital. It creates a weird sort of typical manga-style campy storyline that sort of goes from, you know, somebody becoming a capitalist and the exploitation and all that sort of stuff. I don't know. It's kind of, I don't know. It's kind of weird. I don't know if I can call it capital and manga <laughs> yeah. like they did because it's a narrative format and it's a narrative format and there's a lot they don't touch on. But I mean, it, it's. I think it, I guess it's. I wouldn't. I don't want to knock it too bad. It's a good introduction if somebody just sort of wants like a, I don't know, quick snippet of that but they also do the communist manifesto as a uh, graphic novels as well <laughs> which those ones were yeah also kind of weird but i'm actually just reading the communist manifesto at the moment it's very good yeah have, have you guys read it oh, oh yeah. yeah i i've read it a lot i've also listened to a lot because uh librevox i don't yeah. know if you're familiar with them they have it on there and it's like i don't know an hour and a half to listen to the whole thing or something so sometimes if I'm just, you know, cleaning up around the house or whatever, I'll just listen to that through. Yeah, it's, there's some brilliant writing in it. Yep. It's amazing the amount of, like, I read it and I go, wow, I, I think I I know that line, but I never knew it, you know? <laughs> yeah. There's yep. a specter haunting Europe. Wow, I just thought that was Maggie Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out it's communism. I'm always torn with Marx. Like, the, the language and the, the manifesto in volume one is so... Very nice to read. It's very lovely. But I found Volume 2, obviously, he died before he could put that polish on it. But it was a lot easier to understand, I thought, than Volume 1. Because the language is very nice, but I also think it's kind of a barrier sometimes. Well, you find Volume 2 easier to understand? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think Volume 2 is kind of written like a technical paper where there's not too much flowery stuff in it. Yeah. You know, he doesn't try to write in a kind of a Hegelian way or something. I, I don't know if I... I don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about Hegel. I'm only listening to some videos on him at the moment. But he talks kind of... Some of it's kind of like philosophy a bit. And it can be kind of thick to get through. It can be dense. But then again, volume two, though, is incredibly boring. That's the other thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, into the last 200 pages of that is like watching paint dry. It is real... I'd like to read a really good synopsis of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, do we? What else? Do you guys have any other stuff? I've hardly left out. Oh, the other thing is, there are some people. I meant to say, there are some people out there on the falling rate of profit thing that kind of see it, this kind of falling rate of profit as a, 
a deterministic mechanism whereby we'll have socialism. I think there's also some of that in it. Mm-hmm. That there are people mm-hmm. out there that think, oh, well, like literally I've read a paper, right? <laughs> no joking. Uh, they have a graph. They've done the world rate of profit since I think 1800 to now. Oh, and they can the, tell you the exact date that or the year or whatever yeah, that capitalism you'll say, like, will in, end. In 1806, it was 47.1%. And now it's an average of 8 or 11%. And now we just have to wait till 2061. Um, we should be having, in a, we should be in a communist revolution. You know, <laughs> All right, cool. I'll that, be alive then still. So yeah. Yeah, I think <laughs> we might be just old enough. But like, there is some of that. <laughs> there's some of that determinism in it, and I think people also are a bit allergic to that kind of determinism, seeing how the previous instantiation of a communism was such a disaster that you know had its good points and it had its bad points. But you know, I think it was very much an abject failure for what the ideal was. So that I think that people are somewhat allergic to these kind of deterministic motifs that basically come out of this long-term falling rate of profit. But so you're saying folks look at the, the falling rate of profit, they say, well, if you follow this, then we can deterministically say that capitalism must end, that, that it will end, and therefore because it has that built in, they assume that that must be wrong? No, I think they're just uh, allergic to the de- deterministic nature of the falling rate of profit. Like, the falling rate of profit is a strange one. It generally means the tendency is down, but let's say there was a nuclear war in the morning that hit uh, hit China, mm-hmm. you know, or hit somewhere where all, a lot of the industrial stuff was. You know, that pr- capitalism, the rate of profit would probably spike back up again. You know, that if our if there was some kind of a war or, or, or a massive economic crisis, like in the 1930s, and they didn't manage to, to keep it under control and the, the, the system purged itself, we might see our rate of profit go right back up to where it was in the 60s. And that, like, to kind of think that the rate of profit is just going to magically lead us to a world of communist utopia is kind of, it doesn't, it's kind of naive because you, you totally need agency. Like, if there is a massive crisis, you know, it was the massive crisis that allowed or managed to uh, allow, you know, Lenin and the Bolsheviks to get a a revolution that they tried. If there wasn't for the crisis in in imperialism, which is probably a function of capitalism, at the time, the falling rate of profit as well was linked into imperialism. You know, if it wasn't for that crisis... It wouldn't have given the opportunity for people to have a revolution. So just because the rate of profit is kind of going to the dogs doesn't mean that we're without, we don't need to act. I think there's a lot of that in the, in people's reluctance to talk about it as well. Yeah. Well, again, not to go back to fascism again, but I've heard Zizek make the point and I agree with him that I don't think democracy and capitalism aren't necessarily linked together. I would, say that capitalism probably, I mean, especially, I think, over time, has a tendency to be very anti-democratic and authoritarian. So, I mean, if we're talking about the rate of profit causing the demise of capitalism, I would be scared for what would arise from that without, yeah, like you said, any sort of active part played by Marxists to try and shape something else. I'd be very worried that it would be a very frightening world. I think if we, like, historically... When historically capitalism came out of feudalism and we had, uh, so we had liberal democracy come from it as a kind of a, you know, a, an evolutionary form. We had merchants battling with the royals and the landed gentry for power and you know, they, they used the common man to get power away from the royals and they had elec- elections where, and they stripped away the power of, of royalty and the feudalist system that way. So there was this historical connection between capitalism and, say, liberal Western democracies. But that was a function of, of its genesis. It doesn't necessarily mean that it needs it. Like you look at China. China didn't, China's one party state and they decided, no, we're going to go away from state planning or state controlled all industry. We're going to say have private industry and they still have, they have a dictatorship there. And it shows that like capitalism is it, capitalism is able to, depending on where it comes from, it can birth from different ways that democracy doesn't seem like it's a necessary element. Yeah. Like Pinochet. That's a perfect example of especially neoliberal capitalism really going in and very actively making sure there's no democracy, but lots of capitalism. 
Absolutely. Like how many? God, there's probably so many of them now that I think of it. <laughs> yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. Or it's even depressing. going back to imperialism and colonialism. I mean, that's that's the same thing too. There. Yeah, like even I was in India with work a few years ago, and we was talking to some guy about Gandhi, and he was saying, you know, like Gandhi was. As far as I, I haven't read Gandhi's work, so I'm only kind of going on what I remember him saying that he was kind of thinking we should go back to some kind of communal village production and things like this. That he didn't want to go into a capitalist system, you know. That there was, I think, a lot of these revolutions wanted to go back to some kind of more communal kind of economic system, but it didn't happen in any of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the question of can you go backwards? Like, can you go more to sort of tribal, communal type thing when you already, when capitalism gets a foothold? Yeah, it's very difficult. do you have to, to move forward? I mean, because it'd be weird to be like, okay, well, here's a machine that can, you know, double our cloth production. Let's go back to the old hand looms we used to use instead. You know, like it, I don't know. I, I'm not... I don't think it system, systemically works, but yeah. but just to make the point that like that there was a kind of a desire not to be consumed by a lot of these powers in, into the capitalist system, but they all got sucked. But uh, you might need to totally delete all of that because it could be totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Tony Schmidt and Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.